Welcome. My name's Gary, and uh, until about a year ago, uh, I never really had much of an interest in astrophotography. I've always been a bit of a stargazer from dark sky places, but I had no idea that you could actually photograph some of these things with anything less than a Hubble scale telescope. But I started to learn about this stuff a little bit about a year ago, but had no time to act on it. Then all of a sudden along came a pandemic, and all of a sudden there was lots of time. And uh, so I've, I've pursued a, a, a path of learning. Um, it's something I wanted to learn about, took it to heart, and uh, I've watched just about everything out there over that period of time, read from a wide variety of sources. And you can't possibly remember everything, but you do start to distill uh, into yourself the most important aspects of what you're learning. So I've, this is the first of a series of six videos on a playlist that are going to be designed to help people like me who are with uh, working with a, a DSLR on a tracker, unguided, uh, trying to get from there to some place a little bit better than typical. Uh, following a workflow that's generally easy enough for beginners to follow, but also uh, might introduce some interesting, some interesting knowledge to people even that are more experienced. So we're going to use free software. Um, that's one of my things here. Um, People who have time because of a pandemic don't have a lot of money, so I can certainly sympathize with that uh, situation. Um, so in this video, we're going to talk a little bit about um, who is this for. Now basically, who is it not for? If you're shooting with a dedicated astro cam and you have tracking, Chances are you've got SharpCap or similar software that gives you assistance with figuring out your um, calibration frames and exposure lengths and optimizes everything for you, perhaps even live stacks. So you're not going to get a lot from the beginning uh, of this series. However, in the end, you end up with a stack that needs to be pre-processed and post-processed. Um, so the pre-processing part, I'm going to introduce some free software that provides some critical functions that are gen generally not available to people on the free path. And then in post-processing, I'm going to be using some kind of cool techniques uh, to do things a little bit differently than normal. Now here's a pre-processed, stacked, mostly stretch stretched image of the Triangulum Galaxy. So the goal of my post-processing um, tutorial, if you will, is to take it from uh, that level to this level. Similarly, this project I'm working on throughout this is a much more difficult one. It's um, North American Nebula. But for this set, it's basically 90 by 60 seconds and shot f4 on an f4 lens, which means the, star the stars have horrible chromatic aberration. But I was going for maximum light, and I also shot at ISO 800, which is way beyond the best dynamic range for my particular camera. So anyways, we are going to hopefully take it from that to something more like this. Now this is done without making any color changes. It's uh, done with color contrasting, and we're going to be learning about different stretching techniques and color contrasting techniques and sharpening techniques that are a little bit out there, but uh, they do work. And you could say this is kind of artificial, but at the same time, when you pixel peep it, you realize that by widening the gamut of the reds, you're actually exposing real structures in there that you couldn't see before. And how do you say if it's true color when it's something you can't actually see? All I know is that it hasn't been tainted with filters or anything else, so it's... Uh, it's true as the camera saw it. <clears throat> so the software tools we'll be using are called, uh, the first one, uh, for pre-processing. This is after you have your stacked image, but before any stretching happens. It's called Cyril. It's a free program, not open source, but it's a free program. 
and it's powerful. Uh, beyond the pre-processing, it can also do stretching. It's got functions for arc sine H stretching, which is a color preserving stretching technique, and also for histogram stretching. But in addition, Sorrel has the ability to um, properly pre-process uh, your images with all the calibration frames to register them and to stack them. So I know a lot of people have their favorite stacking software. Sometimes that's based on familiarity or ease of use, whatever. But I'm going to devote two videos in this series to getting to know Cyril, so that a person, when they sit down in front of it, uh, would feel comfortable to do their stacking there as well. And there are some advantages. Uh, with Cyril, we can use scripting to automate a lot of it. And what I typically do is stop before um, actually stacking, but after registration, and you can apply some uh, filtering to the results, which gives you flexibility. You can also apply um, algorithms that extract hydrogen alpha and oxygen-3 from dual-band uh, filtered images. And then from those uh, grayscale uh, panels, you can build an RGB image uh, within Cyril. So if you're going to continue down this path and move into the more advanced kind of techniques, then it's not a bad thing to learn uh, the program that can do it all for you. So, so this series is going to be this introduction. I'm going to be talking about just some background stuff in order to help people achieve success. Um, the second one is going to be about calibration frames, what they are, what they do, what they look like, and the, some guidance on how many to take. And again, this is not for people that have uh, SharpCat Pro who are uh, able to uh, access optimized settings instantly and easily. The third one will be about the serial interface, just learning how to get around it, and about scripting, both finding the scripts and editing the scripts to do different things that you might want to do. The fourth video will be about um, actually stacking in Cyril. And then the fifth one will be about pre-processing in Cyril. And this is the step that most people miss when they're shooting DSLR, because uh, they stack and then they jump over to GIMP or to Photoshop and give it a mighty stretch to see what's there. Well, they just bypassed. As soon as you stretch, the data is no, more lin no longer linear, and you've just bypassed a very important uh, stage in getting, in getting a good image. So we'll do one on pre-processing, which does not take long, and then one on post-processing, emphasizing uh, um, color contrasting as a technique, and uh, also lifting parts of the image with uh, gentle arc sine H color preserving stretches. And we'll also do a stretch based on uh, a color channel uh, for, for the uh, North American nebula. The predominant color is red. So that's another way to uh, get ready for color contrasting is to lift the parts of the image that are more red than other parts. So I wanted to uh, touch on a couple of subjects, not, so, not too much on capture, but one of the things in all my learning I've noticed is that people have a very strong idea about what optimal ISO is. They'll say shoot a third of the way on a histogram from the left, or uh, uh, that's faint, you better bump it up to 3200, or whatever. All those opinions are based on some kind of experience, either interacting with others or through actual shooting experience, so they can't be discounted. I wanted to actually provide a little bit more guidance because optimal ISO actually is more than, it's partially about the subject, but it's also partially about your camera. So I would like to um, move over to a, a website called Photons to Photos. and. Uh, They've got a fairly extensive list of cameras in here and a couple of very interesting charts. The first one you might want to look at is this input referred read noise chart. Okay, and There's a list of cameras over here and I'm going to show you my camera which is a Nikon uh, D7100. Um, this is a, a chart plotting input um, referred read noise versus ISO, so ISO across here 
uh, noise this way. So what this basically says is that this is an ISO invariant camera. So what this basically says is that I increase ISO, that the uh, increased um, signal in the signal to noise ratio basically offsets the increased noise. So at first glance, the implication is that you could bump ISO up quite high without penalty, but that's not the whole story. But the next thing I want to do is show you very quickly an ISO invariant camera. Um, let's go to just a Canon 60D. I'm sorry, this is an ISO variant camera. So in the case of a 60D, as you increase ISO, the extra signal generated more than offsets the extra noise generated. So here there is a distinct advantage to a certain extent to increasing ISO. Now at the bottom of this stairway, or near the bottom of this stairway, is ISO 1600. So like I say, this chart is not the whole story for either of these cameras, but it's, it's good to know this. So let's go back to their home page and look at photodynamic range. Now let's look again at my camera, D7100. Now what this is telling me is I raise ISO, the dyna dynamic range of the camera is falling steadily and consistently. So we know I can shoot from 100 to 800 without penalty on the other chart we looked at. But by making that transition, uh, we've gone from a dynamic range of 10.66 to 7.88. So roughly 20% loss of dynamic range. So in fact, since it doesn't hurt me on the other chart to come back, I can increase my dynamic range to somewhere between 200 and 400 and still have a dynamic range up in the 9 area. So that's kind of my ideal shooting um, goal. Um, so again, that weighed with other factors. It's just more information for your toolbox, that's all. But you, got, you should be aware of aspects of your camera. Now let's look at that uh, 60D again. There it is. <coughs> Okay, now, you know as they move from ISO 100 to 800, there's increases in signal to noise on the other chart. But there's not really, up until you get here to ISO 636, 800, there's not much of a drop in dynamic range. So this camera could actually shoot just as well at 800, better at 800 than it can at 2 or 400. So, like I say, there's no good answer, but a person can actually look at their own camera here and uh, get an idea of a starting point for your ideal ISO setting. Just wanted to kind of clear that one up. Also, when we're talking about ISO, it's important to realize that increasing ISO does not make your sensor any more sensitive. What it does is the sensor still collects the same data and then the software on the downstream side of the camera uh, amplifies it artificially, thereby increasing the signal and, and the noise on the downstream side of the camera. So increasing ISO, I view it almost as like stretching within the camera and probably not a great thing to do. I think you're better off to shoot for maximum dynamic range and then later when you have your stacked image with enough light collected, you can stretch it without blowing anything out and uh, greater dynamic range is a good thing. There could be some exceptions if you're shooting a long exposure that you're going to use as a single frame and you want it to look as good as possible you won't be able to stretch it much because uh, the noise will just overtake it. So you might want to bump ISO in that case in order to uh, get a better single frame. At least something would show up. Or if you were going to stack a very small number of frames, you could actually in the stacking software use uh, an additive algorithm instead of an averaging algorithm with up to five or six frames so that each frame adds to the last one and therefore you could uh, produce something that shows your subject. Wouldn't be the best, but it would be something that shows your subject 
with a very small number of frames. Sorry, just switching around the views. So the last thing I wanted to do was talk about my setup. And this is more geared to the people that don't have equipment yet, uh, maybe shopping for a tracker. I can tell you a little bit more about mine. Also my camera, crop sensor on a 200 millimeter lens. Um, this might be foreign to some of you, so I will go into that a little bit. If, if you've already got a tracker, you're already equipped like this, uh, you probably know more than I do about all this stuff. But you could jump ahead to the next video, which will be having a closer look at calibration frames. But for, for those of you that want to know what a tracker is, at night time, there's very little light, it's obvious. And uh, it's a challenging shooting environment. So the way that we get these images of things in the sky is by mounting the camera on a rotator that allows the camera to follow the sky. And therefore, you can do longer exposures and you can do many exposures. And then combine those exposures to derive all of the signal from the bunch. And uh, anything that's not signal is noise basically gets cancelled out when you combine them together through stacking. So this rotator is the smallest and least expensive of all of them. It's called the Move Shoot Move. Um, I chose that because I wanted a learning platform. I know if I'm going to pursue this, I will ultimately, ultimately need to move up to uh, telescope type equipment. And with that, you need a, a guiding mount. So you need a computerized mount that can actually follow the stars based on following an image in a guide camera. So I thought, OK, let's make the learning uh, platform the least expensive one and also the most portable one. This is literally pocket sized. I can take it camping. I can take it anywhere. In the summer, it'll operate off its own internal battery for about five hours. In the winter, lithium batteries don't do well. So I've got separate power powering everything here uh, when it's below freezing outside. So anyways, to make this one work, a uh, 200 millimeter lens is beyond the recommended length for, for this rotator, but uh, I was able to make it work just by uh, carefully uh, centering the polar scope, so making polar alignment very accurate. And uh, I've got it all set up on a very low and stable tripod. So th these things help. You just don't want anything moving other than the gentle rotation of the camera in this setup while you're shooting. So this one is working for me. I'm not going to do too much on the uh, trackers. Uh, there's a guy on YouTube who is excellent. He's done all kinds of tutorials on equipment, on software, on processing. He's exceptional. His name is Peter Zelinka. He did a video on uh, these trackers, uh, pros and cons of each, and all that kind of thing. So. I will try to look up that video and include a link in the description of this video so that if you want to do some more research, it's a, a very good starting point. So I think with that, we'll leave uh, this video go. We shall uh, return shortly. I wanted to look at the next one uh, about calibration frames. And if that's a mystery to you, then by all means watch. If you know about how to use calibration frames, but not so much about what they are or the math of how many are practical, might also want to watch it. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed this time.